When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. I lost my place. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see how the crowd is pressing in on you? How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was about 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In his book on Christian history, Catholic theologian Luke Johnson describes how the front of a Roman Catholic church contrasts with the back. He says, in the front of the sanctuary, everything is precisely arranged so that it is doctrinally and institutionally correct. The altar and the pulpit have prominence and height, and the words spoken from them reflect orthodox study of scripture and doctrine. Everything is arranged to convey the order and legitimacy of institutional and celestial power. But in the back, in the vestibule, there is another religious world altogether. The parish book of needs and prayers, with its astonishing catalog of pains, worries, and desires laid out for the world to read. The bulletin board with brochures and announcements haphazardly arranged, announcing recent appearances of the Virgin Mary and various prayer meetings in the names of different saints of dubious origins or legitimacy, where the front of the church is concerned with being correct, correct doctrine, procedure, authority. The back of the church is concerned with experiencing transformative power in any available form. The question is not whether one particular saint is institutionally accepted, but whether prayer to her can actually cure cancer. 
not whether the words of one housewife heard declared to her by Mary square with papal decrees, but if those words can transform her family. The front and the back. These categories came to mind when we were discussing this passage in breakfast Bible study this week. Jairus, the man who comes to Jesus because his daughter is at the point of death, is definitely a front of the church kind of guy. He is a leader of the synagogue. One commentator says you could think of him as the chair of the property committee, maybe. He comes to Jesus overtly, falls on his face in a show of deference and obedience and shows clear faith in asking Jesus directly for what he needs. But before Jesus can go reward this man's fidelity, he encounters a different kind of person. The woman who touches his cloak doesn't even get a name in the story. She's a nobody. She has no money after spending it all on doctors. She is sick and weak, and because of her bleeding, she would not have been fit to participate in the synagogue. Far from showing deference and obedience to Jesus, the rabbi, by coming to him openly and bowing down, she tries to say to stay as anonymous and hidden as possible in the back of the crowd. She just brushes his clothes even though that would technically make Jesus ritually unclean as well. I'm not sure which is more shocking. The fact that Jesus allows himself to be distracted and delayed by someone who is content to remain out of sight while he's in the middle of tending to a life or death time-sensitive issue on behalf of someone who was obedient and faithful, or the fact that the woman's kooky, magical thinking about only needing to touch the hem of Jesus' clothes for healing actually worked. Now, there is no question that most of y'all prefer to sit in the back of the sanctuary. Maybe it's a little different when, you know, it's a holiday weekend and we only have one service and there's really no choice but to move forward. But I think that's where most of us prefer to sit. In fact, for about seven seconds when I was deciding my sermon title, I thought I would just put a music stand right by the door of the narthex and deliver my sermon from there. (laughs) It wouldn't be the first time that a pastor's done it. But that's not exactly what I'm trying to get at with this analogy. In reality, I think most of us at St. Barnabas and in our denomination are front of the church kind of Christians, regardless of where we sit. We know the primary purpose of worship is to praise God, not fulfill our own needs. We understand Jesus' miraculous healings to be metaphors or allegories for spiritual and social wholeness or vestiges of the biblical author's pre-modern understanding of medicine, not promises that faith in Christ can heal our medical problems as well. On the contrary, we are likely to be rightly aware of the ways these passages of Scripture have been abused. They've done spiritual violence to the millions who have prayed and asked God for healing, and to quote our passage, rather than getting better, grew worse, and were then blamed for their own misfortune told it was because, unlike the woman in the story, they didn't have enough faith. In fact, I understand my own call as a pastor to minister to folks who have been hurt or alienated by both ends of the church, not just the front, but the back as well. Now, all that said, Even if we are a front-of-the-church congregation, 
in leadership and on the whole, perhaps. Some of you are here because you seek real transformative power in any available form. Some of you are here because you crave healing, peace, and comfort in the midst of lives too chaotic and frantic and broken to worry about doctrine or orthodoxy or what size cubes the communion bread will be cut into this week. Yes, that was actually supposed to be funny. (laughs) And it makes sense because all over the world, as we see the well-to-do, theologically correct front of the church denominations getting older and smaller and fewer, the back of the church Christian movements are exploding. Over one out of every four Christians in the world is now Pentecostal or charismatic, meaning they believe in gifts of the Spirit like faith healing, prophecy, and speaking in tongues. More than one in four. So while primarily front of the church ministry may be our past and present, don't be surprised if the concerns of the back of the church dominate our future. In the 21st century, I believe the typical person looking for a church home cares less about whether the theology is liberal or conservative, whether its leaders vote for Democrats or Republicans, and more concerned, to borrow from the Pentecost sermon Blair Money delivered at the May Presbytery meeting, with whether worship in that church offers a direct perceivable encounter with God through the Holy Spirit. Real transformative power in any available form. Now before you start writing me concerned emails about how I want to bring the charismatic renewal movement into St. Barnabas and get everyone starting to speak in tongues, Let me finish what I have to say about the scripture passage. Don't worry, by the end of the sermon, you might still want to send me angry emails, but not for the reason that you think. When Jesus stops to heal the hemorrhaging woman, the back of the church figure, we are worried that Jairus, the front of the church synagogue leader, has gotten short shrift. Jesus' conversation with the woman caused the hourglass to run out for the girl. But in fact, we learn it has allowed for an even greater miracle to occur. Jairus came to Jesus for a healing, but received instead a resurrection. What links these two stories that are sandwiched together in today's reading is faith. When Jesus tells the woman in verse 34, your faith has made you well, and tells Jairus in verse 36, do not fear, only believe, he is using the same Greek word, pistis, trust, faith, belief. Both figures with their radically different social standings and different approaches to God and relationships to institutional religion have it. And through it, God's grace is made real in the form of healing for both of them, but not only that. In this story, we also see an expansion of what was thought to be possible for the theology of the synagogue leader, the front of the church, and the expansion of dignity and economic prospects from the hemorrhaging woman, the back of the church. An expansion of what was thought to be possible. 
author and Christian activist Shane Claiborne in his book, The Irresistible Revolution, tells a back of the church story about God's power. While he was volunteering at a health clinic in rural Mexico, they ran out of medical supplies. Everything that is except for Pepto-Bismol. And he promises that he's not trying to be a spokesperson for Pepto-Bismol. But nevertheless, they did not run out of need. People kept coming desperate with all sorts of ailments, so the clinic offered what it could, prayer and Pepto for all. But, Shane writes, the crazy thing is that people were getting healed. And the Pepto never seemed to run out. Whether there is a perfectly rational explanation for this is not Shane's point. His point is twofold. First, he seeks to celebrate and testify to that transformative healing power wherever it is found, to praise God wherever healing and wholeness occurs in God's name. And two, to point out that miracles tend to belong only to the desperate. Most, but not all, of us front of the church goers have our comfort and money and doctors and options and nuanced theology. Rarely do we need miracles, and when we do, our theology does not always leave us open to them. But in the back of the church, when someone is sick, prayer and faith may be both the first and the last option. But, and here's the part I'm going to get emails about, if that makes us uncomfortable, we have only ourselves to blame. Ironically, it is in synagogues like the one Jairus led that the hemorrhaging woman would have been ostracized for her condition and told that her sin caused her misfortune. Likewise, if you're looking for reasons why the poor all over the world and in our own country seek Pepto-Bismol miracles for their ailments instead of modern health care, it is in part because of the front of the church how the front of the church has long sought economic excess for the powerful rather than economic justice for the poor. It is because we have preferred conversations about civility to conversations about racism. It is because we have preached the gospel of law and order instead of the gospel of refuge and hospitality. It is because we have made the political statement of saying nothing at all about oppression instead of proclaiming loudly and clearly that God implores us time and time again to care for the least of these. So to get on board with the back of the church charismatic movement, is only to pay attention to the hemorrhaging woman's story, to only get half the point. Maybe we better not just stand gawking at the amazing ways God's power is made manifest to give healing and hope to the desperate. Maybe we better follow Jesus up the road to be a part of the even greater miracle, the miracle God will work among the powerful, the miracle of resurrection of the church's prophetic voice, new life given to young girls and boys so that they will teach us to pray with our feet. 
because God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven is what true doctrine and orthodoxy and order look like. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.